Hola, les damos la bienvenida a los clásicos de esta semana. En nuestro segmento les presentamos material periodístico de valor histórico, pero también de interés y relevancia actual. Hoy en los clásicos de esta semana les presentamos una entrevista con uno de los economistas de mayor prestigio en el mundo, el profesor de Harvard, Danny Rodrigue. A lo largo de sus ediciones, el programa esta semana ha tenido la oportunidad de invitar a personajes de alto perfil como Rodrigue, quien ha cuestionado y ha abierto un debate sobre la globalización. Veamos la entrevista que le concedió a Carlos Fernando Chamorro en 2016 cuando visitó Nicaragua. Rodríguez habló sobre los desafíos para el país y el papel de las instituciones democráticas, opiniones que hoy día continúan vigentes. Buenas noches, profesor Rodríguez. Un honor tenerlo en nuestro programa. Buenas noches. Nice to be here. <risa> en la conferencia que brindó el viernes pasado en Funides, usted describió el enorme rezago de la economía nicaragüense en cuanto a productividad y competitividad, pero parece que este no es un fenómeno exclusivo nuestro, sino un mal generalizado. ¿Por qué? As you say, this is very much a, a Latin American problem. And uh, what has happened is that uh, on the one hand, um, uh, e economies like Nicaragua are able to produce uh, relatively productive modern enterprises, uh, but uh, that those enterprises remain relatively small. Um, and most of the economy um, is, uh, is quite unproductive. So the challenge is to grow the size of the modern part of the economy and have more of people move from the traditional to the modern. Usted dijo que Perú es uno de los pocos países de América Latina en que el crecimiento se ha basado en incrementos en productividad, aunque paradójicamente los últimos gobiernos peruanos han terminado con índices muy bajos de popularidad. ¿Qué ha hecho bien Perú y qué le falta por hacer? I think Peru has been uh, relatively successful in the Latin American context in terms of uh, diversifying into new products, especially in, in agro uh, industry, in, in, in non-traditional Uh, agriculture, uh, but you know there is a there is a you know often a disconnect between the politics and the economics, and uh, in, in in the long term they connect, but uh, over shorter periods of time they can move in different directions. Pero qué le ha permitido a Perú ser más exitoso que otros países en términos de productividad? Um, I think uh, Peru has a, a much better dialogue with the private sector. I think the government has been much more engaged uh, with the private sector. Um, and I think it has used some of its uh, commodity uh, windfalls um, to, to diversify its economy into, into new products. And I think that's the kind of thing that Nicaragua needs to do, which is to move away from its traditional specialization, find ways of bringing in new companies uh, that will diversify its, uh, its economy. Las llamadas políticas del consenso de Washington, que a inicios de los 90 abogaban por las reformas de mercado como una panacea, no han producido los resultados esperados, pero tampoco ha funcionado el intervencionismo estatal. Ahora usted aboga por una suerte de nueva política industrial basada en otro tipo de relación entre lo público y lo privado, pero dice que no hay recetas únicas. Entonces, ¿hay algunas claves que pueden explicar qué es lo que funciona mejor? I think um, every, uh, every um, fashion in economic policy has a, a, a core uh, that's valid, uh, but then it becomes, it turns into a fetish. I think uh, the old um, view of economic policy that gave a big role to the state um, had a core valid uh, point, which was that uh, markets on their own don't necessarily produce the kind of transformation you need. Uh, but I think it was excessively optimistic about what the state could achieve through public uh, investment, through protectionism, through subsidization. And then we got to the Washington Consensus, and again, the Washington Consensus had a very valid core, which was that you need market-friendly, business-friendly regimes, you need the government to maintain and establish macroeconomic stability, but it too turned into a fetish, which said, the market will take care of everything and the only thing that the government needs to do is provide the fundamentals. I think now it's not that the, fan, the pendulum is swinging back. I think we are getting into a synthesis that's taking us forward, um, that we understand that the market and the state both have a role. And, and what 
my colleagues and I are trying to do is, is, is develop that synthesis that uh, avoids the extremes of both of those kinds of, of uh, perspectives. Hablemos de las reglas básicas que hacen que esta relación entre el sector privado y el Estado funcione de forma apropiada. ¿Cómo se puede evitar que el interés colectivo y las instituciones públicas sean capturadas por los grandes consorcios económicos nacionales e internacionales? So I think there are there are three key elements to this. One is um, uh, maintaining an open dialogue and uh, between the state and the business. Uh, that's forward-looking, uh, a dialogue that always asks where are the new market opportunities, where are the constraints, what can the government do to find solutions to the problems that new businesses face. Um, second, I think that dialogue and relationship always has to have an element of a discipline, which is it has to be a disciplined dialogue so that the state, the business, doesn't always ask for handouts, for subsidies, for protection. Uh, but that in, 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 what for, in return for whatever help the government provides, uh, that they are able to undertake uh, commitments in terms of capacity, in terms of employment, in terms of exports, that the, that, that the government is able to monitor and evaluate what the, government, what the private sector is doing in return. And I think the third principle is, is uh, which very important in a democracy, which is that this whole process has to be accountable um, uh, towards the broader public, so it has to be transparent, so it doesn't turn into cronyism and corruption. But I think the, those are rather abstract principles, and I think the skill and the craft here is how a government uh, turns it into an actual uh, process in practice, uh, cognizant of the realities of, of a country. Cuando habla de rendición de cuentas, usted no la circunscribe a la esfera pública, sino que también la aplica al sector privado. ¿Cómo se puede fiscalizar tanto al Estado como al sector privado para que ambos respondan? Well, I mean, I think in, in, in well-functioning democracies, we have, uh, of course, a free media, we have civil society organizations, we have the electorate uh, at large. So I think um, open publication uh, um, uh, in terms of, of, of full uh, provision, providing of accounts, um, a, uh, a, a legislature um, that's uh, um, uh, uh, examining what the executive does. Um, I think the specifics, of course, of accountability differ uh, in different political systems, but uh, I think uh, one of the advantages of this region uh, is that uh, democracy has become an important objective. Um, and I think in that way it's very different from East Asia, uh, where governments necess have not necessarily paid a lot of attention to accountability and transparency. In a way, it makes this, the, the task harder here, uh, but also makes that uh, a much more important objective to have as part of this uh, strategic dialogue. En Nicaragua, por ejemplo, existe una alianza público-privada para abordar los temas económicos, pero la política y las instituciones se manejan como un monopolio bajo el control autoritario del presidente. Los poderes del Estado no tienen autonomía ni contrapesos. No hay Estado de Derecho ni rendición de cuentas. Y ahora incluso la oposición ha sido ilegalizada y tampoco hay elecciones libres, transparentes y competitivas. ¿Debería esto preocuparle al sector privado? ¿O se puede separar de manera permanente la economía de la política democrática? You know, um, we, we certainly have examples of countries that have uh, sustained rapid economic development uh, under, um, under uh, authoritarian regimes. So I don't think the link between political regimes and economic performance is very tight. However, when we think about what development is about, uh, it's not only about economics, it's not only about um, economic growth. Uh, a lot of development is also in terms of giving voice to the people and, 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 and enriching people in terms of their uh, social, uh, giving them a voice, giving them a sense of participation in the political process and uh, accountability of the people who, who, who rule them. So I, I think that uh, I, I, I don't try, I, I think about uh, the political elements that you just mentioned as an integral part of development, but not necessarily of economic development per se. So I do think they're very important, 
but I would not want to make an argument for the rule of law or the separation of powers or a liberal democracy on economic grounds alone. I want to make an argument for that on the basis of a fuller conception of development, which also includes the development of the polity. Veamos el caso de China, que tiene un sistema político cerrado y una estrategia económica exitosa en base a la extracción de grandes recursos, pero no pareciera que esto pueda replicarse en economías más pequeñas. ¿Qué nos dice la historia sobre la sostenibilidad de este tipo de regímenes? Well, I think um, there are very few uh, non-democratic governments that have uh, produced uh, sustained economic growth. And I do think that the authoritarian nature of the Chinese government eventually uh, has come to throttle uh, economic growth and, and, and probably right now um, stands as a very important uh, obstacle for the future development of China. So I like to compare India and China, where India as a democracy has already had that political transformation. Nobody says India's democracy works well, uh, but it is a democracy. I think compared to uh, uh, India, China will face a much tougher future precisely because uh, it still faces that political transformation of moving into a multi-party democracy without which I don't think it will ever, uh, you know, it will have to make that transition uh, um, at some point. So. Again, it is a it is a longer term issue with respect to its economic costs. What one thing we know that if we look at statistically, countries that um, are authoritarian don't necessarily grow at lower rates than democratic regimes, but they produce a lot more instability. In other words, if you want to look at economic crises, if you want to look at volatility, if you want to look at at social uh, strife authoritarian regimes tend to be full of those. And democracies don't always produce the fastest economic growth, but they tend not to produce economic crises. Uh, they tend to produce much better set of, of, of social outcomes and more egalitarian outcomes. ¿Y quiénes son los principales actores de estos procesos de desarrollo? Hemos hablado como si esto fuera un baile de tango entre dos, el gobierno y el sector privado. ¿Qué importancia tiene el debate público para discutir las políticas económicas para otros sectores? Well, as, I think as a, as a, as a matter of, of practice, I think the two actors that uh, probably um, do play the most important role are the business and the government because the government sets the rules under which business operate and business has the resources to invest. Uh, but, you know, as I was saying earlier, I think, uh, you know, their participation and their dialogue has to be framed in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in the context of accountability and, and, and transparency and that's because you know, ultimately we care about uh, society as a whole. Now I think one of the things that's extremely important is, is, is the role of uh, civil society organizations and independent media, uh, a political opposition, um, a, uh, a, you know, independent judiciary, and, and those are of course, you know, in integral elements of a democracy, uh, which uh, both push for that accountability and transparency and in turn make use of those mechanisms for, um, for ensuring that the process is not simply one of cronyism between government officials and business. Pero también hay un sector dentro del empresariado que tiene una aversión a factores que podrían conducir a la inestabilidad y pareciera que se sienten más cómodos con una especie de estabilidad autoritaria. When I talk to business people, um, and I, I have to say this, uh, I, haven't, I haven't been in Managua for very long, but uh, the, the, you know, when, when I've talked to business people here, uh, I've been struck by, in fact, um, how they say that democracy is important. Um, I think there is a keen sense of history uh, here in Nicaragua of, of what uh, this country has gone through uh, under a dictatorship. And, uh, Esas han sido conversaciones privadas. These have been private conversations, and I think uh, every business person I've talked to has emphasized, in very emphatic terms, uh, the importance of, uh, of of the rule of law and and, uh, and political competition and, and open democracy, and not just so that property rights are protected, uh, but 
for the broader functions of a democracy, that, that there is an environment of free debates and free speech. So I, in, in some countries that is absolutely true, and I think you will find a lot of business people in, in East Asia uh, saying that, you know, uh, um, as, as they say in comparing China versus India, in, in, uh, you know, in, in India they have law, in, in, in China they have rules. So if in terms of the rule of law, you know, do, would you rather have some stability or would you have the law? It's much better to have an authoritarian regime. But not, uh, I have not encountered that here. En su libro sobre las paradojas de la globalización, usted describe las tensiones que surgen cuando se trata de alcanzar al mismo tiempo globalización económica, democracia y autodeterminación nacional. ¿Qué tipo de implicaciones tiene esto para un país pequeño como Nicaragua? Well, you know, it, I don't think it's all that different between large and small countries. I remember a Chinese student of mine who once described China's approach to globalization uh, in very apt term. He said our approach to globalization is we open the window to the world, uh, but we also put a mosquito screen on it. Uh, so we get all the fresh air that we want, uh, the new ideas and new technologies, uh, but we ensure that we're keeping the mosquitoes out. Um, and so the way that, that China has approached this is to have a sort of a, a balance uh, that on the one hand, for example, they you know, have foreign investors come in, uh, but on the other hand, they've insulated themselves, for example, from financial instability by going much slower on, on financial liberalization. I think each country has to, um, has to find that balance on its own. But we're pa way past the point where everybody thought that just, you know, just sign as many trade agreements as you can, you know, get rid of all trade barriers and the economy will take care of itself. No, you need a government that's also active and therefore uh, is all able to, uh, to, to um, help markets uh, develop. So globalization, yes, but I say globalization on a country's own terms. Um, and I think countries that have done the best out of globalization are those that have managed to combine globalization with domestic strategies. Ahora, el ascenso del nacionalismo en Europa, la crisis de Grecia, el Brexit en Gran Bretaña, incluso el fenómeno de Donald Trump en Estados Unidos, ¿están relacionados con este descontento con la globalización? I think very much so. I mean, I think, um, you know, what this, as a result of globalization, um, two things has happened. Uh, one is that economically, many people uh, feel that they've been left out of the gains uh, because globalization has had very unequal effects. Uh, if you were a well-skilled professional, a banker, a financier, a multinational, uh, an exporter, you did very well. Uh, but uh, if you did not have that many skills and you now you had to compete with imports for China, that was not very good for you. Uh, so the economic impact was uh, for a lot of country, for a lot of people, negative. But more than the negative, more, more than economics per se, I think there was also a, a clash of values and a clash of, of, of a tension within democracy that was generated, uh, that, that people felt that they, had, they were losing control over their lives, that the decisions were being taken uh, that um, was not um, you know, part of the democ democratic process. And the political class, uh, badly m mismanaged this by essentially saying, well, this is a new era, it's globalized, we can't do anything about it, it's all, you know, it's either, you know, there's no other thing we can do because we need to compete in a world economy, so just grin and bear it, uh, or uh, even if we wanted to do something, you know, we couldn't because we have no control over these things. So I think what we're seeing now is, is, is a reaction both against us, these it is uh, unequalizing forces, uh, as well as a political reaction that says we want to hold these controls closer to our hands. Entonces el péndulo se está moviendo de regreso hacia procesos de toma de decisión a escala nacional. Supongo que esto requiere algún grado de democracia y participación para que sea más legítimo y quedaría desplazada esta idea de instituciones globales de gobernabilidad. Absolutely. I, I think there was a certain kind of globalism that went with um, Global economic globalization where a lot of elites and political um, uh, classes put some kind of faith on, on 
global institutions and global governance. And this, this of course, went the furthest in Europe, uh, where quite a few transnational institutions were, were indeed formed. But we now see the limitations of that, that for, for ill or, or, or good, um, our only democratic institutions are those that exist at the national level. So that means we can never transcend them. And it's very dangerous uh, to allow markets uh, to become global and international wh while our politics remain still largely national. Uh, so as long as we cannot make our politics global, and I think the obstacles uh, facing that are huge, we will have to necessarily bring some of our economics back home as well. Este ha sido nuestro segmento Los Clásicos de esta semana, patrocinado por Café Selecto. Gracias por acompañarnos. Compartan nuestro video y suscríbanse a nuestro canal de YouTube Confidencial Nica para continuar apoyando el periodismo independiente.